Hello, everyone. I'm Sharon. As Aaron said, I am from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Born and raised there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have been a part of the House of Prayer for about six years now. I joined in Kansas City in 2012. And then I've been, I did four years of IOPU with Daniel and with Krista. We graduated together two years ago. And like Aaron said, I've been in the House of Prayer all over the world um, and just kind of strengthening it. And I just joined 111 in Kansas City two months ago. And yeah, it's bizarre how God works. Didn't know I'd be here six months ago and thought I'd be in Australia, Australia long term actually, but God changed that. So I'm super happy to be here with you. And so today, I'm going to be talking about what we just sang through, what the worship team just sang through. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Song of Solomon 1, verse 5 to 7. If you have your Bibles, please turn to that. That was Song of Solomon chapter 1, verse 5. And I'll just read it out loud. We can all follow along. It says, this is the, sh the Shulamite or the bride she's speaking, and she says, I'm very dark, but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me a keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you whom my soul loves, where you, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? I don't know how many of you have studied the Song of Solomon or heard this passage. Cool. That's awesome. So I had never heard the message of the Song of Solomon until I went to IOPKC. That's probably a similar testimony for a lot of the people here. Um, and I never really understood this. I'm dark but lovely. I'm like, okay, I'm dark. And for me, my personal story is, I grew up in the church. My, my parents are pastors. Um, I've never had like a blatant season of rebellion. And I give praise to God for that. I've never, um, yeah, walked away blatantly from the Lord. Um, but of course, I've still sinned and stumbled. So I think the hardest part for this, for me, is to actually see my dark side. Because that sounds really conceited and really pride. There's a lot of sin even there in that statement. But because I haven't had an intentional moment of, of falling into um, like catastrophic or sin or something that, not, something that people would label as catastrophic sin, um, I found it hard to connect with this verse until I started meditating on it. So the Shulamite says, I'm dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. So the tents of Kedar in history or like in the Bible, what it's referring to is the dark tents that were made out of wild goat hair. They were blackened tents. And that was outside and they were dirty. And then the curtains of Solomon, they were white curtains in the Holy of Holies, in the temple. So she's saying, on the outside, I'm dirty, I'm, I'm, I'm dark, but on the inside, I know I'm lovely. And I love the confidence that she ha says about that, the confidence of love that she has. And Jess hit this really great last night, that confidence and love, that when we, know we, when we know who God sees us on the inside, we are confident in who we are. And we can walk in confidence before man, and we can walk in confidence before the Lord. And um, for me, I realize, and I think a lot of us can testify to this, in the last six years of just being in the house of prayer and learning about the Bible, learning theology, I find the more I know about God, the less I actually know about him. And... I find I'm learning all these things about him, and my question is, who are you? Like, how, really, who are you? The more I dive into this book, I'm like, who are you? I don't understand you. I don't actually know who you are. And I think that when we're walking close to God, we see our sin. And this is kind of, I'll, I'll incorporate a little bit of how I, my own story in this. And... 
Um, but then there's also those that are completely unaware of their sin, but they're also not walking with the Lord. And so here she sees her sin, but she knows she's lovely to the Lord. And it's, for me, it's important to determine um, um, how we respond to a crisis of stumbling and sin for those that really love Jesus. I believe everyone in this room, you love Jesus. We all love Jesus. And um, stumbling isn't casual. It's um, how we respond to a crisis in sin um, determines how we move, whether we move forward or whether we draw back because of shame, uh, because of condemnation. And I think a lot of believers give up. Um, they, they give up on the brink. They get caught up in shame and the pain of that shame. And they, they believe that it's easier to actually draw back from the Lord than to fight and to actually believe this truth that God doesn't wait for us to get our stuff together. He doesn't wait for us to, to get in. He doesn't have this penalty box. You know, we have the penalty box that we place ourselves in and the Lord doesn't. And so he, he takes us as we are in, the, in our darkness, in our depravity, in our weakness and he just wants us to talk to him. He just wants that relationship, that dialogue. Um, and I think a lot of times when believers fall in sin, they, they wallow or they feel bad, um, thinking that if they put them out in this timeout business, then God is more keen or more quick to actually forgive them. And maybe it'll even the score, so to speak. Um, and Jess also hit on this last night about spiritual immaturity and rebellion, and it's not the same. Spiritual immaturity isn't the same as rebellion. Um, we, we will always stumble. We're human, we make mistakes. But the Lord, I love that when we repent, when we come to him with a repentant heart, we can actually just press delete. We repent and we say, we're sorry, Lord. And we keep fighting, we intentionally fight against that sin that made us fall. Um, there's an example of um, the sheep and the, the swine. The sheep and the swine, they can both get stuck in mud. And the shepherd will come and get the sheep out. And the sheep is like struggling in the mud. And when it gets out, it's like, I'm so glad that's over. Like, I'll never do that again. But the swine, the pig, when he gets out of the mud, he just goes and tries to find another mud hole. You know, and that's the difference between the, the spiritual, spiritually immature and the blatant rebellion, the rebellion of the swine. He wants to go find that mud hole. He's st going straight back into the same sin. And for the sheep, he's fallen, but he, he, he's fighting against it. He doesn't want to, to fall into that again. Um, and I love that, that um, in, in this passage, I'll go into it a little bit more, but you see the Shulamite's willing spirit. And I think about Peter, the Apostle Peter, and he was so zealous. And he said in, in the Gospels, right before, um, um, right before Jesus goes to the cross, um, Peter says, no, I won't deny you. When Jesus tells him, you're going to deny me, you're going to deny me. And he, Peter's like, no, I'll never do that. I'll go with you to the, to the cross. And and Jesus is like, I know your flesh. Your, fle your flesh is so weak, but your spirit is willing. And he sees that, and he calls that out. And he knew what Peter was about to do. He knew Peter was going to deny. But um, I love that when Jesus appears to him eight days later, and he, um, so backing up a little bit, we see that Peter denied the Lord. And he resigns from ministry. He's a fisherman before, so he goes back to his previous occupation. He leaves ministry after Jesus has di uh, died, and he doesn't feel qualified anymore to be an apostle. His heart was wounded by failure in denying Jesus three times. And so when we discover our sinful flesh, sometimes some believe that it's too painful, too painful to reach for the highest things in God if they believe they will constantly fall. Sometimes we'd rather quit than, falling, than failing over and over. And sometimes I've, I've seen believers that lower their vision, their life vision, in order to not feel the pain of failing. They imagine God is angry, disappointed, grieved at them, and they live in condemnation and shame. 
Now, eight days later, Jesus appears to Peter. And this is in John 21, 15 to 17. And we can, we can go to it, but I think you all know it. But Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I do. And he says again, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes. Peter, do you love me? A third time. And he says, I do. And I just love that God doesn't need this information. He already knows that Peter loves him. He says it for Peter's sake. To, to almost just erase those, th those three denials. To affirm that Peter's love was sincere in the beginning. And to call him forth. He wants Peter to realize it himself. And I just love that Jesus in his kindness was calling Peter back to that relationship before the denial. That's who he is. The Lord is revealing to Peter how much Peter loves Jesus. And I feel like God does that for us. He does that to you and I. He's so gentle. He's so kind. And we're the ones that put ourselves in, that, in, the, in the shame. And obviously, the enemy's there accusing us night and day. Um, but the Lord, he's so kind. And um, it's, a, it's as if the Lord was saying, Peter, you do love me. In the garden, eight days ago, I told you that you had weak flesh, but your, sp your spirit was willing. You didn't believe your flesh was weak. You need to understand that you have a willing spirit. You, each one of you in this room, have a willing spirit. You have that yes in your heart. And Jesus sees it before you stumble, before I stumble. Um, and often we just get caught up in our weak flesh. But God sees our sincere love for him. And God saw it before we stumble. He still sees it now, after we stumble. And Jesus broke Peter's shame in order to restore that confidence he had in him. And we get condemned because we have an unrenewed mind, and it's the work of the enemy. The enemy is there, like I said, to, we all know, to, he's just accusing us night and day. And we need, I think one of the greatest things that a human heart needs is the assurance that God enjoys us, that God actually likes us. Um, he enjoys this relationship with us. Um, we were created to be enjoyed by God. And no matter who you are, if you're walking with the Lord or not, our, our spirits were created to know that we are loved and enjoyed by our Creator, by our Father. And the fear of rejection, the fear that God is done with us when we f stumble and fall, it's, it's really real, actually. It's really, I think a lot of us are afraid um, that God, God is done with us. Or if we, if we stumble, it's like the last time. If we do it once more, God's done with us. And that same sin that we continue to stumble in, or, um, and the enemy is filling us with shame and condemnation, and he doesn't want us to talk to the Lord about it. So he, and every time you stumble and fall in that same area, um, you just get further and further down this like little hole, I feel. Um, but... Yeah, I think, yeah, but we need the washing of the word. And I love that, that I feel like this is a great community, and we all need accountability. We all need each other. I need my brothers and sisters to fight for me, to pray for me. I need vul people to be vulnerable. I know we all say that, and it's really not easy. And I think it's, it takes humility. It takes, I'm not doing okay, and I need prayer. Can you pray for me? And it's really real, because we all go through it. No one has it all together. No one has all their ducks in a row. And we're all human, and we sin and fall. And so finding those like one or two people that you can go to and that will fight for you intentionally and, and intercede on your behalf is super important, I feel, in, in getting out of the shame and out of the condemnation. So the Shulamite says, I'll just go back really quick. She says, I'm very dark, but lovely. And why are we so lovely to God? She says this out of the confidence that she has in the Lord. But we are lovely to the Lord. It's because he is so kind. He's so merciful. The one that's evaluating is so generous and merciful. 
It's his personality. It's in his character. It's in his nature. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and God thinks you are beautiful. He thinks I'm beautiful. And we are... And if someone else looked at us and someone else judged us by their standards, they'd probably just call, they would write us off. And, but God views us differently. We're also lovely because we've received the gift of righteousness. Our loveliness comes by receiving his righteousness. If we, if we call ourselves believers, we are made lovely in God's sight, not by what we do, but who we are before him when we say yes to him but because of what Jesus did on the cross. God can't improve upon his own righteousness. So much so that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. We're also made lovely because we have a willing spirit, just like Peter did. His flesh is weak, but his spirit is willing. That's the same for us. Our flesh is weak, but our spirit is willing. And at the new birth, when we say yes to the Lord, the Spirit puts a yes in our spirit to God. First Peter 3 says the incorrupt, incorruptible beauty to have a right spirit before God. It's, it's a very precious thing in God's sight. God looks at our right spirit and he says it's incorruptibly beautiful. And just lastly, we are lovely to God because he sees the, the beginning to the end. We are his eternal bride. And Billions and billions and billions of years from now, he sees each one of us from the beginning to the end. And he sees the fullness right now in the present. He sees it all. And we are the one that Jesus longs for. He sees us in the fullness of what we will be with him for eternity. He sees how you will respond to him in billions and billions of years. So the Shulamite goes through this journey as I read, she says to, in verse 6, Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So here we see she has kind of a spiritual crisis. Do not gaze at me, she says. So don't look at me because I'm dark on the outside. Don't look at me. The sun, she's been worked. So in this context, she's in the field. She's outside working, and she's, the sun has darkened her skin. And she's been working in the vineyard, but not her own vineyard, it says. She, uh, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So the sons here, they're the ones in the church that don't value her faith. She is on fire for the Lord. Um, she's going for the highest things in God. Um, it brings a spirit of conviction. I find a lot of times if you are living a fiery, godly lifestyle, other people around you, even in the church, will be like, ooh, you're, that's too radical. And they'll say, ooh, that's legalistic. Or they use those words, especially to affect young people, because young people don't want to ever be called legalistic. So they're like, okay, let me go party or whatever. No, that's, I, I think what they mean is your lifestyle is convicting me, and that's, it's bothering me. And that's what they actually mean by that. So seriously, just keep going, keep being fiery, keep being holy and righteous before the Lord. Um, so she feels the shame of the stairs. They're looking at the gaze in, I think, NKJV, it says, the staring. Mine is ESV, but it's, she's saying, don't gaze at me. Don't stare at me. Um, she's feeling the shame because they see her failures and the darkness of her heart. And these brothers have overworked her. She's feeling rejection. Her assignment was made as hard as possible. And she's feeling rejected by her brothers that her heart or her own vineyard wasn't kept. And she feels like Jesus is at a distance from her. And she feels burnt out spiritually because she's been overworked. And I believe that burnout doesn't come from being, by being overworked. I believe it's being, working with the wrong spirit. And it's, I think there are people that do overwork themselves. I feel like it's maybe like, you know, 1% of the population. But 
Um, there may be that one guy that puts too much work, but mostly it's working in the wrong spirit. They get burnt out because they aren't recognized or they're not noticed. They stay in a ministry for one, two, three, four, five years. No one's noticed them. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to quit. I'm burnt out. And, um, I just feel like God's asking, like, isn't this between you and me? Like, did, is, didn't you do this for me? Didn't you do this? Didn't you sign up because you wanted me, not affirmation from other people? And then there's dullness. She kept other, other people's vineyards, other people's hearts she, she kept, but not her own. Our first responsibility before the Lord is our own hearts. That's the only thing we can actually take with us into the next age is our hearts and the love that we actually, the, the, the way we responded and how we let love grow in our hearts. That's the only thing that we get to take. We don't get to take our ministry. We don't get to take money. We don't get to take anything, our reputation, only how our hearts grew in love. That is eternal, I believe. Um, and then distance. She feels distance. She's veiled. She said, why should I be like the one who veils herself? So here, women wore veils around strangers. And so here she's saying to the Lord, why am I serving at a distance as though I'm a stranger? Why am I far from you? And I believe that everyone has a secret history in the Lord, and you really can't give what you don't have on the inside. Um, you can't impart something that you don't already have. And I think I hear a lot of like awesome messages. And, but I don't want to be a teacher that teaches and gets people excited, but my life is barren. Because I think that can happen. I think a lot of people rely on their skills or just like past experiences. I want a heart alive in love with Jesus, the man Jesus. Yeah, and I want people to believe that they can do it too, that they can talk to the Lord. I, it's not beneficial to me if you're like, oh, this is great, and you do nothing about it. I want this to stir you to, to talk to the Lord, to cause that dialogue to happen. Then, then that's successful. I want this to point you to the Lord. So as Jess talked about yesterday, she talked about chapter 1, verse 1. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth or his word. So that's, that was her originally. That was her, her, her declaration of love. She said, Lord, let me, kiss me with the kisses of your word. But then it got choked out of her because she wasn't tending her own vineyard. She wasn't tending her own heart. And I think a lot, like I said, we, we just get consumed with in this race and society and, and, America, and uh, North American culture and everything. We just, we want to be noticed, even if we're in the marketplace or in ministry, we want to climb that corporate ladder. We want, even in ministry, we want to be noticed for our skills, for our giftings, and, and we want to be noticed. I think God's, that's the way God made us, but it's having that, that eyes for one, that, we, that audience of one, and yeah, I don't, I don't want God saying to me, I thought you were doing this for me. And, I, you know, like, I don't want that to be my story. I want to be rooted and grounded in love for him with that one thing devotion. Um, so later on, or she says, she says t in verse 7, tell me, you who my soul loves. I love that. She, she knows, she, she has confidence and love right there. Tell me, you, who my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be one who veils herself beside the flocks of your companions? So she's talking to the shepherd here. Where do you pasture your flock? Where do you feed your flock is another way to say it. Um, Yeah, um, getting fed by the Lord, it's, it's, it's hard. It's easy, it's hard. It's, we're really dull and we're really boring, so it's hard sometimes. But I love that God doesn't give up on us, and he fights for us. He chases us down. I've had so many testimonies of just being in that prayer room in Kansas City and 
and almost falling asleep or and and I just say one phrase and often it's Song of Solomon one kiss me with the kisses of your word and just like the Lord just I don't know how it works honestly but he does it he comes in he breathes upon his word and I'm weeping. I'm like, even last night, I did not expect to, to just be so tender. My heart was so exposed, I felt, so raw. And I was like, God, you're doing it again. And I feel like tears are such a good indicator. Not that you have to cry. I'm not saying you have to cry. But I love tears because, I mean, he keeps them in the bottle. But also that it's like a good indicator for me that I am feeling, that I am in tune with my emotions. And I think it's a little, maybe it's easier for girls to cry. I don't know. We're kind of, we're kind of sensitive and stuff. But, um, but I love it. I love being a girl. I love being feminine. And I love embracing my tears. And I, I don't, God doesn't say they're weak. So I feel like they're strength, actually, being in tune with my emotions. So, um, yes, yeah. But um, so going just back to my own testimony of, of, just not being in tune with my own sin. And I mean, through the six years, yes, now I, I am. And I, I, I realize I'm way more depraved and way more wicked than I ever thought I was. And sometimes it's too much, and I'm like, God, stop. And he's so kind. He doesn't overwhelm me in my sin. Um, but it's not just those, like, those blatant sin that everyone, those scandalous sins that I'm thinking of. It's I want my tongue to be bridled. I want to spend my time wisely. I want to steward my money rightly, the way, biblically, the way that the Lord wants me to. I want to love my enemies well. And if I fall short in those areas, then I'm stumbling in sin. And that's like, that might be too high, but I, I just want to go for it. I don't want to just try to get by with just coasting or just seeing how close I can get to that line, you know? and not cross over that line of sin. I just want to I want to fight for righteousness. I want to fight for holiness. We only have one life to live, honestly. We have 70, 80 years and then we have billions of years. And the 70, 80 years that we live, maybe 100, determines everything else. And I think the world just tells us that we have to we have to go for, you know, save it up, you know, save up for those vacations, save up for retirement and um I just, I just want us to have this eternal perspective that we were created for so much more. Um, yeah, and I, I think that this was my first reaction. I, I, when I came to the Lord and my sin and repentance, I, I expected the Lord to rebuke me. And I think a lot of us do. We're afraid that God's just going to call out all our junk. He's going to call out all our sin. He sees it all. He knows it all. But it's actually shocking when, when it's the opposite. And off, it, it's mostly the opposite, actually. He wants the spirit of shame to be broken. He doesn't want us to live in shame and condemnation. He wants it broken from our lives. He wants to speak comfort to our hearts. I love Isaiah 40. It says, um, I'll just turn to it really quick. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. It says, comfort, comfort my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. And, it go, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all our sins. I just love that God has given us this example of Jerusalem. I'm not replacing, like Jess said, I'm not using replacement theology or anything, but I just love that God wants to give Jerusalem double honor for shame. And I think that's indicative to our relationship with him. He wants to give us double honor for shame. That's just who he is. This is his character. This is his nature, his personality. He says he wants to give you double honor for shame. He wants, he's the God that gives comfort. And he speaks comfort in the process of shame. What kind of God gives double honor for shame? I don't know another God. And he delights in us. I think we all know the scripture in Isaiah 62. He calls us Beulah and Hephzibah. Um, yeah. So I'll just uh, keep going along, chugging along. Um, 
So just back to verse 7, she says, tell me who, you who my soul loves. She's crying out in desperation to have more of Jesus. She remembers the sweetness of her communion, that verse 1, kiss me with the kisses of, of his mouth, and sitting under the apple tree. She longs for the kisses of his word and the closeness and nearness that they once had. She loves him deeply and cries out, tell me, O oh you, who my soul loves. And she knows she's failed in her weak love, but she's not giving in to the accusation of the enemy. And she's desperate to encounter Jesus. She, will, she longs to be satisfied in him and wants to know where he feeds his flock, where he feeds his believers. She's saying, I've been fed by others, but now I want you to be the one to feed me. Where will you satisfy the cry of my heart? And then it goes on to say, um, where you make it lie down at noon, for what, yeah, for where you make it lie down at noon. And um, the sh sheep, a shepherd with its flock of sheep, will make its sheep, or his sheep? Is that the plural of sheep? Sheep? Yeah. What's the singular? Okay, I was like, wait, am I saying this right? Uh, sheep. Um, the heat of day is at noon, and the sheep will lie down when its stomach is full. And God wants us to rest. Even in the midst of the heat, in the midst of pressures of life, he wants us to connect with him and not just work for him. And then I love the response of Jesus. Now, this is in, we didn't read this yet, so it's verse 8. I have it 8 to 11. Or 8 to 10. So he, this is Jesus or the bridegroom. He's saying, If you do not know, O most beautiful among women, follow in the tracks of the flock and pasture your young goats beside the shepherd's tent. I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. I love that Jesus' first response here is, if you don't know, I, I think you're beautiful. He, like, that's what he says the, right off the bat. She's like, I think, you're, I think you're beautiful. He doesn't even address the sin. He doesn't address any of her, of her depravity or her wickedness. He's just saying, he's affirming her. He's saying, I think you're beautiful. I, I love you. He doesn't point out her failures or weakness. And... Um, Sorry, I'm just moving on to different notes now. So here, Jesus gives he gives three uh, th he gives threefold um, instructions or affirmations to her, and the first one. He says, like I said, if you do not know, he answers, her, or his answer surprises us. It speaks tenderly, tenderly to her heart, addressing her shame and rejection. He addresses her as the fairest, the most beautiful of all women. The word fair is, is translated to beautiful in the NIV or in the NAS. And then... He says, if you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock. So f he's saying here, um, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tent. Follow in the footsteps of the flock means don't live in isolation. Live in community. Follow in other believers. Bring them into your story. Obviously, the ones that you trust and that you have a relationship with. Um, and then feed your little goats. Disciple others, other believers, ones that are younger than you or younger in the faith than you. It's important to actually teach what you receive. And I feel like it, it also solidifies, what, um, and it also um, yeah, solidifies what you believe, and it also tests what you believe. Amen. Yeah. Um, Amen. And it's beside the shepherd's tent. The sh where the shepherd lives, the, the church. The, you want to do it in, in, with the church. In, um, 
Yes. Sorry, guys. My notes just got all mixed up. Yeah. He then goes on to say, I compare you, my love, to my, to my mare among ch Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. Jesus gives, um, the, the, he gives these, uh, these pictures to, to say, to compare her with. Um, so Pharaoh's chariots, his horses were the most beautiful in the world, and they were the most well-trained. They were white, they were pure. I think white represents the, the purity, and they were well-trained. So he's talking about her obedience, her devotion there. And then, um, and then secondly, your cheeks. The cheeks represent um, emotion. You all know that you can read someone's emotion by their faces. You can see if they're, if they're angry or they're mad, if their countenance changes by their face and their cheeks. Um, so he's saying, your cheeks, your emotions are lovely to me. <laughs> and, your neck, <laughs> and your neck with chains of gold. The neck is referred to a lot in the Bible, and it talks about the will, your, the will, um, the act of the will. Even though it's weak and small, it's beautiful. There's a cry in your heart. I love that the beauty that Jesus possesses is the beauty that he imparts to us. He's our shepherd. He's our leader. And I love that he's not a stoic God. He's full of emotion. I love that we were made in his image. And often I'm like, oh, why am I the way I am? Like, why am I so emotional? Why am I so dramatic? And I'm not saying God's dramatic or emotional. Well, kind of. But I love that we were, we were made in his image, and, and he's an emotional God, and he feels what I feel. And I love that Jesus is still clothed in flesh. He's still human, and he knows exactly what I'm going through. He knows um, my heart. He knows everything that we, we have gone through, and he's already done it. And, and how can we not trust a man that's already gone through it, and where he was despised by his own creation, that he came... The Son of God was a baby. He was a baby, and he had to crawl on, on earth, and he had to, he, he, you know, he's walking the very, the very earth he created and the trees that he created. And, and I feel like it's so intentional of the Father. So my, my heart just groans to know more of him and to know even Jesus as a teenager reading the Song of Solomon. Did he know it, it was talking about him? Like, what, how, what did he feel when he read the Song of Solomon for the first time, knowing it was him, you know? Even the other books of the Bible, but specifically the Song of Solomon, and knowing that this is, this is our story, this is the journey of the bride, this is, um, and his story. And I just love that it's, it's to be continued. Um, I love that, that we have the seasons of the, of, of the bride, and we can... I often go and I'm like, oh, I think I'm in this season, or I'm sitting under the apple tree, or um, uh, winter's over, springtime has come, arise. Like, I, I've, there's so many times, even in my Bible, I've like noted it, like fall 2015, like <laughs> because I'm like, this is so real. I feel like it's so relatable what has happened, and um, for me, actually allowing these words, it, it seems weird, honestly. I. Like I said, I never thought that I could connect with this book the way I, I have. And just knowing, um, yeah, that, that I can actually meditate. And there's so many cross-references in the Bible and actually going deep. And I love that Daniel actually got the worship team to sing through it. Because there's, like we, we all know, there's power in singing the word. It gets, St. Augustine said that singing was praying twice, you know? And so um, I love that we were able just to kind of demonstrate the worship of the word and also sing through the scripture. And yes.
Also, I've never taught on Song of Solomon. Sorry. So I'm a little bit frazzled at the moment. But um, thank you. Yes. So I've gone through it verse by verse, but basically it's the revelation that we know that even though we fall in sin, we don't stay in that, that shame that we allow the love of Jesus. I think it's a lot easier said than done. And I think just in order to be intentional and fight for it. And often I don't feel like it. When, I'm in, when I make a mistake and I, I make the same mistake over and I fall into the same sin, I, I do feel condemnation. I do feel shame. And, um, but realizing that God... Honestly, God doesn't wait for me to pick myself up. He doesn't wait for me to make myself clean. He doesn't wait. He, he says, just, just talk to me. Your weak little yes, the, the movements of your heart, they really move me. I'm satisfied with you, and I love you. I call you beautiful. I call you forth as lovely, even when you don't feel like it. And I think a lot of times we have to not go by our emotions. Emotions are so fleeting, and... And it's not about feelings a lot of times. It's just, there's so many times when I don't feel like doing something. And, but when I do it, I, I, I think God actually loves just being faithful and just showing up. I think half of the battle is just showing up to something. And when you show up, God moves. And we don't expect it. And I'm seeing the fruit of being faithful, faithful in the place of prayer, faithful in the place, place of um, in my secret time and in worship and fighting for those little areas of my heart that I really, I didn't think we were a big deal, but, um, but now I'm, I'm realizing, even as I'm talking, I'm feeling convicted as these little areas that I could totally improve on and loving people well and falling short and loving. And um, yeah, so that is all I have prepared. Um, it was short, but sweet. But yeah, I don't know where Daniel is. Oh, he's coming. I can hear him. Um, but I would just love to pray together. And just... Um, I would just love to pray for one another. And just... Um, I just feel like we need to know that God enjoys us. Even when we are caught up in sin. And even when we're feeling really weak and broken when we stumble. So I just want to, yeah, just let's just all close our eyes and we'll just talk to the Lord. Jesus, we just say we love you. God, in our weakness, in our brokenness, God, you see it all. We are laid down bear before you. And Jesus, we just say, come. Search us and know us, God. See if there be any wicked way within us. Jesus, we don't want the sin that, we, that's, that so easily entangles us, God. We don't want to keep falling into those same traps. Jesus, I'm asking for your light to shine. Yeah, I just feel like, just talk to the Lord, talk to the Holy Spirit, but those certain areas in your heart, just ask the Lord to even bring them up, expose them, and just, as he does so gently, just give them to the Lord, release them before him. God, I thank you that you say our weak love is real that you don't despise the, the weakness of my heart. You don't despise the weak reach of our hearts. The small yeses are emphatic and they're huge to you, God. Jesus, come and wash us again. We just say, come and have your way with our hearts, God. You know us so deeply, 
So shine your light, God, even in the darkest, the darkest places of our hearts, God. We just say we trust you. We trust you to show us where we are, we're, we're coming in short, where we're, we're failing, God, to love rightly, to love you well, to love other people well. Father, I'm asking that you would remove any fear The fear of failing you, God. The fear of being far from you. Jesus, you're bringing us close to you. I just thank you that you are the one. You're the closest friend we have. You are the lover of our soul. How can we not trust your leadership? If you'd like to have more prayer, I'd love to pray for you, and we can have others that pray for you. So just come on up, and we'll do the same thing as last night.